Good things. So I want to continue on um, eternal security, work salvation, um, and today I want to teach you a bit about um, the the objections that I have heard to eternal security, and the um, passages that people tend to go to to support that view. Uh, so if you haven't, if you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, where I covered the topic of what we believe about eternal security once saved always saved i'd encourage you to go back and listen to that because i don't really want to take too much time summarizing that again uh, but let's get into some of the passages or more of the passages because we covered matthew 7 and matthew 25 last week and how people try and use that to either preach work salvation or preach that you can lose your salvation so we at this church don't believe you can lose your salvation we believe once you believe on the lord jesus christ you have eternal life so you cannot lose it and we believe that that eternal life is obtained by grace through faith alone so you believe on the lord jesus christ you don't have to do any good works your church attendance does not get you to heaven your t you know how much you try not to sin or your decision to do better that does not get you to heaven these are all good things to do but these do not save a person the only thing that saves a person is their faith on the lord jesus christ and what he has done and when they put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, they receive eternal life, not conditional life, not temporary life, eternal life. So it's something that happens once. Once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved eternally. You're saved forever. But no matter how clear the Bible is, you know, the Bible says this by grace through faith. The Bible says to him that worketh not, but believeth. People still try and find verses to contradict that. But we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So we have to take all the Bible into account when we formulate a doctrine and we try and get an interpretation of the Bible that is sound. So we have these clear passages and now we're looking at the passages that people try and go to to um, try and uh, dispute a clear, these clear passages in the Bible. So. It will feel a bit like I'm sort of going into a topic halfway, because I am, am, so you'd have to go back and listen to those sermons. But let's go to Luke 8. Luke 8, and we'll just look quickly at the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. So this parable appears in a few of the different Gospels. So we'll read it, and then uh, we'll, we'll cover a few points about it. So in verse 5, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it, and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up, and bare fruit, and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the parable of the sower is very famous. Um, a lot of people know it. There's basically four scenarios. The sower goes out, he sows seed, some fall by the wayside, the birds come and eat that seed. And then there's a scenario where some fell upon, um, uh, let me just get the order right, some fell upon a rock, so rocky ground, and then they sprung up and then the sun came up. And because they didn't have any deepness of earth, they, they withered away. Um, the, third, the third scenario is a seed that fell among thorns. And then the thorns choked this seed. So then the, the ground did receive that seed. The thorns choked it, and, but they didn't bear any fruit because of those thorns. And then the last scenario is the seed that fell on good ground and sprang up and actually bare fruit. Now, if, we, if, if that's all Jesus said, right? If Jesus just gave us the parable and just gave us these three scenarios, then we could make this parable just mean whatever we want, right? We could say, well, maybe this is what it means, or maybe this is what it means. Well, maybe this scenario people are saved, and these scenarios people are not saved. But there are some parables in the Bible where they're not left to interpretation because we're actually given the explanation by Jesus. If we continue to read on, we see here, and this isn't the only um, gospel where we're given the explanation, but I'm going to this one just for a reason. But we see here in verse 9, and his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? So the disciples of Jesus actually go to him, and after hearing this disciple, and say, hey, what do you mean by this parable? What does it actually mean? So it's not something we have to figure out. We're actually told we just have to compare Scripture with Scripture and just read the whole chapter. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, 
that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. So if you remember last week, I talked about this, why Jesus spoke in parables, and it was to confound those that did not believe on him. And, and, and to a certain extent, even today, I feel like the parables are there to confound people that are not willing to just humble themselves and realize that salvation is through Jesus alone. You know, rather than them thinking, oh, you know, I've got to be a good person. I've got to do my part. But no, you, you can't just believe and not do good works and expect to go to heaven. No, that's, that's salvation by grace. Salvation by grace is you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you do nothing, and you can go to heaven because it's all Jesus. That doesn't mean it's right to sin. Nobody's condoning sin. It just means if you sin, grace will abound. So um, he says here that this is why he, might, he would speak in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. So they're hearing this parable from him, but they don't get what it means. Now he's going to explain it. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So we're told here what the seed actually is. The seed is the word of God. It's the words in the Bible. Um, as somebody hears them, they decide what to do with them. Now, um, if somebody hears that word, but then they don't receive it, it says here that the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So they've heard it, they may understand it, but unless they believe it, it hasn't been received into their heart. Now, many people dispute over these parables in terms of, you know, is it the, the first, only the first situation where the person is not saved? Or is it the first three scenarios where people are not saved? It's only the last scenario that bear fruit is saved. And they'll say, see, if you're saved, you'll have fruit. And they'll say, oh, the fruit is works. So if you're saved, you'll have works and you'll bear fruit because of the parable of the sower. But is that what's being taught here? Because Jesus says here, he says, he taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So this, go, this goes to show if the devil did not take the word out of their heart, if the word didn't get removed out of their heart, then they would have believed and got saved. They would have received it and the, the word would have been received and it would have turned into something where it did in the other situations. It sprung up. So this is very clear here. So we don't have to wonder, wait a second, is it, is it the first three scenarios where people aren't saved or is it the only the first scenario? This is why I turn to Luke 8, because Luke 8 actually explains to us that it's only the first scenario where the person is not saved, where that seed did not actually go into the heart and the person got saved because the devil took away the word out of their heart. And look in verse 13, it goes on even further. They on the, on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe. So you see, so how they have believed, they have received that word, and in time of temptation, fall away. So remember when I said last week, salvation is not a state of belief, because it's a moment of belief when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. So once you have everlasting life, you cannot lose it. So what this is talking about is people that believe, they're really happy about getting saved, but then they start getting temptation, tribulation, people making fun of them, maybe persecution, and then they get out of church. They fall away. And we'll talk about what fall away means in another verse later on. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So the parable of the sower is one where people will say, ah, see, just because you've heard the word, just because you say you believe, but if you don't bring forth fruit, then you're not saved. Whereas in Luke 8, when Jesus actually gives the explanation of the parable of the sower, he makes it very clear that the only reason why the first scenario didn't get saved is because Satan took it out of their heart. Otherwise, they would have believed and gotten saved. And then when he goes on about the ones that fell on the rock, he actually does say that they do believe. And the Bible says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So um, that's the parable of the sower. So salvation is a moment of faith. It's not a state of faith. And I think that's very important because we are very clear when we say, hey, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to keep our salvation by works because salvation is not by works. 
But then somebody might think, well, what if I stop believing? Then am I still saved? Well, the point of salvation by grace and salvation being an event that you're born again at a moment in time is that you don't need to keep your salvation. So you're not keeping your salvation by works. You're not keeping your salvation by the state of your belief. It's a moment of faith where you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and in faith, and at that moment, you are saved. You're given eternal life. And there are times where you might have faith and might lack faith. You may be increasing in faith. You may be diminishing in faith. But if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ and you're born again, you are saved no matter what. And because God cannot break his promise. Now let's go to another one. Um, and I know I'm just going through these quickly because I just want to get through a couple of them um, just on this topic. So let's go to John 15. Because John 15 is another one. Um, and maybe when you guys talk to people and you talk about salvation by grace, you talk about eternal security, you may come across these verses again and again and again where people try and use these parables and stories in order to support either a work salvation or the fact that you can lose your salvation. And this one about fruit is always really prevalent. We talked about Matthew 7 last week, um, and then we just saw before with the parable of the sower, they say, oh, only the one that had fruit you know, is, is the, truly the one that's saved. And another one here is in John 15, which is the vine and the branches, where Jesus said, you know, I'm the vine, you are the branches, the branches will bring forth fruit. And I'll say, ah, the branches that didn't bring forth fruit, they're the ones that aren't really saved. And, you know, Jesus is going to take them away and be cast into the fire. And, uh, you know, you're not really saved because you're not proving your salvation. Well, let's read John 15. And we'll go through it, just, uh, and I'll show you the differences, and show you that this is not actually what it's teaching at all. Um, John 15. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Um, if, he that, if he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man bide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So we're told here, you know, Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, he wants us to bring forth more fruit, and he's going to purge us in order for us to bring forth more fruit, and this is how God is glorified. Now fruit can mean several things in the Bible, maybe the things we say, it can be the people that we get saved, um, and it can be um, our, our rewards and, and the way we act as well. But what, what, what can fruit mean in this instance? Um, it, it, it could mean all those things. But um, let's see, I want to just show you here because um, people generally will try and make it only mean works. And they'll say like, well, if you don't have works, you know, therefore you're not saved because he's going to take it away. Well, let, let's say even if it is works. I don't think this is what this is passage is teaching. Let me show you. So in, um, let's just go from the beginning again. I am the true vine and my father is the husband, husbandman. Now look at this. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So there's a couple of things in this passage here. First of all, this is not a branch that is not in Jesus Christ. This is a branch that is in Jesus Christ because he's saying every branch in me, right? So this is somebody that is abiding in Jesus Christ. Later on, we see the person that is not abiding in Jesus Christ. So he says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, is there anything here in verse 2 about being thrown into the fire, about being cast out, about losing eternal life, losing your salvation? No. He just uses the phrase that the branch is taken away. Now, what does taken away mean? Well, this is open for interpretation, isn't it? Is, is taken away going to contradict salvation by grace? Is taken away going to contradict eternal security? Clear passages in the Bible? No, right? So this is just saying here that there's a branch that's in him that's not bearing fruit that God is going to take away, right? 
So if we were to align that with what we believe about salvation, what we believe about eternal security, you could say that, well, what he means by this is maybe he's going to remove you from the earth. Maybe he's going to get you out of church. You know, if you're not bearing fruit, you're probably not going to be in church that much. You know, you're not going to be amongst the vine. You know, we talked about the church being the body of Christ. Generally, people that are not being a fruitful Christian aren't in church, you know. And sometimes God is going to have to purge that branch. He says here, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So people that are trying to bear fruit, God is going to try and clean up that branch. He's going to clean up your life. And that's why sometimes when you start living for God, hey, you might lose some of your worldly friends. You might find some opposition with your family members or your colleagues. You might lose some people that used to like hanging around you but don't like hanging around you anymore uh, and things like that because God is trying to clean up your life. He wants you to bring forth more fruit. He wants glory from your life. And the more He purges you, the more fruit you're going to bear, the more glory He gets. Now, another thing as well with being taken away, when you take something away, where does it end up going? Like if I take something away from Simon, who has it now? I've got it now, right? So you see how it's different to a branch that's been cast out, right? Because cast away is you're away from God. But then if there's a branch there and he's taking the branch away, that means the branch is with him now. So it could mean that, you know, like Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, when they lied about how much they gave to the apostles, God killed them. You know, he took them away, but they didn't lose their salvation, you know? So every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. Again, people will try and take this abide in me as, you know, you're, you're like walking on the narrow way, you're doing the right things, you're keeping the works, right? I don't think that's, you know, you could, you could interpret abide in me different ways. The way, the, the way I think the right interpretation is, it just means you're saved. Once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're abiding in Christ and he in you. I don't think it's like a perpetual thing. I think once you bring forth fruit, that's, you know, once you are abiding in Christ and you're in the branches trying to bring forth more fruit, that's the work you do for Jesus Christ, the rewards and the things that we talked about last week. But just abiding in him is not something that needs to be preserved. I think it's once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are abiding in him. He is abiding in you because you're saved and you're sealed. Now, why do I think that? We read on, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. So what I think this is saying here and that, with that interpretation is, if you're not even saved, you might be trying to win souls to Christ and things like that, but you're not you're not bearing any fruit because you're not even saved. You have to be saved, right, to, in order to be bearing fruit for God. So um, that's why he's saying, you know, you can't bear fruit except you abide in me because without me you can do nothing. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Let's go on to verse 6. If a man... So here's the other scenario, right, where people get mixed up between the branch that's taken away and the branch that is cast, away, cast out. If a man abide not in me. So you see the difference now. There was the, if a man abide in me, he, he doesn't bear fruit, he's taken away. This is, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. So this is the branch that is thrown out of the presence of God. Um, cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So some people, when they try and come up with a different understanding of this parable, say, well, it's not that this is talking about hell, it's just the, the, the burning desire of wanting to be with God or something like that when, you, when you're cast out. So they'll, you're cast away and it's just, maybe you're cast away and it's the trials and temptation and chastisement that God gives you. Um, I personally think when it says, you know, you're cast into a fire, you're cast forth and you're burned, it's hard not to take that as, as hell. You know, because the chastisement of God on a son of God as a believer is not fire and brimstone. It, it, it's, it's different. It's chastisement with a rod. Whereas this is talking about gathering them up uh, and casting them into a fire very close to whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So I think the right understanding of this is, see, if you're not abiding in Jesus, you're not saved, therefore you are not taken away. You're actually cast forth as a branch 
and men, which the angels will gather up people and cast them into the lake of fire, then they are burned. Now, I won't go into all the reasons why I believe, um, you know, I won't go to all the verses, sorry, of why I believe it's abiding in Christ is just salvation. But verse 7, I think, gives us a hint, and there's many verses in the Bible that sort of link this thought together. He says here, if you abide in me, and the clue I think we're given here is, and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Scriptures, and you're familiar with how the different parts of the Trinity are referred to, it's pretty interesting when you look up abide and abideth in the Bible, um, where he says here, if ye, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. And we know that you know, Jesus Christ is the Word of God, and the, we're, we're born again by the Word of God. You know, we're born again by the Spirit. And the fact that you know, Jesus Christ is the Word of God, Jesus, when he was speaking in John 6, said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. Right? So it's like the Word is in you, the Spirit lives in you, Jesus lives in you, Jesus is the Word, the Word is truth. And we read in, 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 in 1 John, I, I'm pretty sure, that the, the Spirit is truth. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and even in 1 John 2, it talks about the anointing which he received, and it is truth and is no lie, abideth in you. So you see how the word is truth, Jesus is truth, the spirit is truth, he's abiding in you. Um, it's all sort of linked up. So that's why I believe when the Bible talks about abiding in him, it's salvation. It's not a, a continual daily thing that we do. Like some people would take it to mean like your works or... Uh, as you uh, believe. Um, but, but it could. It could work that way as well. I mean, even if you took this as works, you could say, well, you know, if you abide in Christ and you're not bearing any fruit, he's going to take you away. You know, the works. If you're not doing the works, he's going to take you away. Maybe you're going to get out of church or maybe he's going to kill you. Um, all right, so I hope that gives you a better understanding of John 15. Um, let's go on to another passage. Let's go to Revelation 3. Another one I've heard a lot is the church in Sardis, where, uh, let's read it here in, uh, in Revelation 3, 1 to 6. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, <laughs> These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found, found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So again, he's, he's exhorting, he's rebuking this church because of the things that they're doing. But then he says here, and this is what the verse that people normally go to, to say you can lose your salvation. Uh, it says here in verse 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So they'll, say, they'll come to this verse and they'll say, See, here you have to overcome. You have to, you know, you have to do the works. You have to endure until the end or whatever they're going to say to make it mean that you have to keep your works. See, otherwise Jesus is going to blot your name out of the book of life. You're going to lose your salvation. Well, hey, let's compare scripture with scripture because if we go to, um, and maybe some of you are familiar with this passage, but in 1 John 5, what does it mean to overcome? When it says, he that overcometh, you know, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Well, in 1 John 5, 4, Look at what it says here. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So again, see like with John 15, we can't just make abide mean whatever we want. We can't just make fruit mean whatever we want. We have to compare scripture with scripture. So it's the same with the church in Sardis. When he says overcome, what does that mean? Well, if we compare scripture with scripture, we go to 1 John 5, 4. It says whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So how do you get born again? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, John 3 is talking about being born again. Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Um, so it says here, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And look at this. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, 
even our faith. Again, teaching us that salvation is by faith alone, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's go to another one. That was a quick one. Let's go to Colossians. This is another one that I've heard. And I, I might miss one that you guys have heard. These are the ones that I'm familiar with. Colossians 1. Uh, so where did I go? Colossians 1. 21 to 23. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So I'll read verse 23 in a second. So we can see here that they'll say, ah, you see, you know, you, you weren't saved before, you were alienated, but now you're, you know, you're saved by the body of his flesh through death. And he's going to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable to God, right? To present you without blemish. But they'll say, ah, but there's a condition. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So they'll say here, ah, see, you'll only be presented unblameable and unreprovable if you continue in the faith. Well, you know, it's not really talking about losing your salvation and things like that. You know, it's basically saying here that, you know, you know, if we, are, you know, we could take this to mean, you know, well, if we're saved, you know, if we, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are continuing in the faith. We will continue in the faith and we'll be presented unblameable, unreprovable. Another way you can take it is it is talking about your, uh, uh, your works. And if you, if you, do do the works if you believe on the lord jesus christ and you do do the works and you are obedient and you do earn a lot of rewards then you will not be ashamed when you are presented to god and when jesus presents you to god so just because it's saying here um present you holy unblameable unreprovable that doesn't mean that you're going to lose your salvation that you won't will not be saved when you face um god now, one thing I want to show you as well here is in uh, Romans 1. Let's go here to verse 17. Because I want to show you here that there's a difference um, when the Bible talks about continuing in, in the faith as a believer. That doesn't mean that you know, if you stop believing, you're going to lose your salvation. It's just in encouraging people to, you know, to do the right thing. But in Romans 1, we actually read here in uh, verse 17. He says here, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So believers are not only encouraged and exhorted to, you know, believe on the, you know, for, sorry, for unsaved people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, but saved people are also encouraged to walk in the faith and do what's right. So the Bible uses the word faith to refer to both. And you have to look at the context of the passage to see, are we being exhorted to continue in the faith in the sense that do good works as a believer? So as a believer, we can't lose our salvation? Or is the faith talking about the faith needed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? So we see here in Romans 1.17 that God has revealed a faith to faith for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith so you go from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ the faith that is required to get saved to then as a believer that cannot lose their salvation because they have eternal life living by faith because we live by faith because as we read and we study and we learn the Bible you're not going to do it unless you believe it, you know, but then, you know, um, so that's what it means to walk by faith. Like you hear God's word, you hear the commandments that you're meant to keep and you believe them and do them, but that has nothing to do with salvation. Now, let me show you here. I want to show you um, in Acts. Let's go to Acts 14. And this passage, I believe, shows us where there are believers... So we know believers cannot lose their salvation because they have eternal life. 
and they are exhorted to continue in the faith. And we can um, sort of compare this to the Colossians 1 passage showing that believers can be exhorted to continue in the faith, not meaning that they can lose their salvation. Uh, let's go to Acts uh, 14.21. So this is in Acts 14. Look at this. It says here, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Look at this. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we, that we, mu that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So you see how that he's confirmed the souls of the disciples. So he knows that they're disciples, they're people that are following the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's exhorting them, these saved people, to continue in the faith, to continue doing the work of the Lord. All right, so that's Colossians 1. Let's go to another one. Uh, hopefully I can give you an explanation for this. Galatians 5. Okay, Galatians 5. Um, let's read from verse 1. The Bible says here, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So somebody might say, ah, see, the Galatians were believers. And Paul is saying here that, that if they went back and they stopped believing salvation by grace, then they would lose their salvation. Christ won't profit them. Christ will become a no effect, of the, uh, effect unto them, and they are fallen from grace. Now, there are two ways that people sort of uh, take you know, Galatians. You know, is Galatians 5 talking about believers, um, that where it's not profiting them because if you don't walk by faith, then Christ does not profit you as well? Because you know, as believers, we cannot walk by faith, and Christ becomes no effect unto us in our spiritual lives, not in regards to our salvation. I think it is talking about unbelievers, though, saying if somebody does not believe that salvation is by grace, then you know, possibly they're, they're not saved and Christ is not going to profit them. So the question really here for Galatians 5 is, is Paul thinking that these, is he referring to believers or is he referring to unbelievers? You know, is he saying that they, that they are actually saved? Or is it like in 1 Corinthians 15 where he says, you've believed in vain, like you've believed the wrong things. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, they started to doubt the resurrection. They started to, they started to, there were people in the Corinthian church that were denying the resurrection. And this is where Paul uses that phrase, you know, maybe you've believed in vain, meaning you've believed something, but not the, not the truth. You know, it's like Mormons believe something, Catholics believe something, but do they believe the truth? Have they believed something in vain to no profit? And this is what I think he's talking to the Galatians about. He's, he's worried, did they actually believe the wrong thing if they were so easily persuaded to believe work salvation again? Um, and he's exhorting them and telling them and rebuking them, saying that, hey, if you believe you have to keep the law, you, or you have to be circumcised, you're a debtor to do the whole law, and the gift of God, Christ, becomes of no effect to you. You are fallen from grace. But that's really the phrase there that they try and use to say that you've lost your salvation. They'll say, ah, see, they were saved, but now they've fallen from grace. And I'll touch on that in a second. But does Paul think that they're believers or unbelievers? It's interesting because if we go back to chapter 4, um, here in verse 19 and 20, As you read through Galatians, and, and Paul is dealing with this issue of work salvation and a false gospel, I believe Paul is starting to get the idea that they are not saved. You know, whilst he believed they were saved at one point, because he doesn't know, Paul doesn't know whether these people are saved or not. He went, he preached them the gospel, they confessed it with their mouth, but can he tell that they believed it in their heart? He can't tell, right? But as he's dealing with this issue of the Galatian church, you know, he's really saddened by this. And look at what he says here in Galatians 4 verse 19. He says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. 
So he's saying here, I wish I was there so that I could talk to you and, and change my opinion of what I'm thinking because I'm not even sure if you guys even got saved. You know, I'm doubting that salvation. And this then goes on to chapter 5 where he says, if you believe that you had to be circumcised, then you're not saved by grace. You're saved by works and Christ is not going to profit you. Now, what does it mean to, to fall from grace? And, you know, we saw this phrase as well when we were talking about the parable of the sower, you know, they fall away. Does fall away necessarily mean that you were at, you, you had salvation and then you lost salvation? Or, you know, of course, see, we, we would say, oh, of course it can't mean that, because if it meant that, that means you could lose your salvation. What about eternal life? What about salvation by grace, not by works? You know, we have to take the whole Bible into account when we think about these things. So what, does it, what could it mean when the Bible says ye are fallen from grace? Does it mean that they had salvation and lost it? Or well, we don't think so. I think it means when you fall away from something, it's just that you had a position, you were, you were somewhere and you left it. You, went, you, you changed position. You know, maybe you, you, you know, it's like you were in church and you got out of church. You fell away from church, but does that mean you lost your salvation? No, so you can fall away from something. You can fall away from a position, meaning like some people might, you know, for example, have believed that the King James Bible was perfect, and then they fell away from that. They, they thought that the NIV was the Word of God. There is no Word of God, or the real Word of God is some nebulous Greek original somewhere that nobody has. So they might have, that, have had that position, and they fell away from the truth, but they didn't necessarily lose their salvation. So again here, I think they, they had the truth, meaning they, they understood it and they knew it, but maybe they didn't believe it and now they have fallen away from it, kind of like the word being taken out of their heart that they, and they didn't receive it. But what I want to show you here, I, I, I want to show you a couple of examples where I believe I can show you examples of believers falling away and unbelievers falling away to show that that this phrase can apply to both somebody that you know understood the truth was really close to believing and then fell away and never got saved but also people that are saved and then are deceived into believing something false and therefore falling away from the truth so let's have a look at a couple of passages there and uh, maybe i'll end on this point over here so hebrews 6 some of you guys might be familiar with these passages. As you hear the references, you might already know where I'm going. And that's good. You know, if, you, if, you, if I say a reference and you already know where I'm going, that's good. If you don't, hey, you need to, you need to read and study your Bible more uh, and get to that point. Um, Hebrews 6. Um, let's read from verse 4. So this is a passage that is talking about people that become reprobate because they just get so close, but then they reject the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 6 verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away. So there's that passage, fall away. From, you know, because they were enlightened, they tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. They were partakers of the Holy Ghost. They were there. They heard the word of God. You know, maybe they were in church. They heard salvation by grace. They understood it, right? But they never believed it. It says here, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So what that passage is saying here, that people who just get so close to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they, they understand, you know, you've, and I just think back in, in even my own personal life with high school friends and things like that, where people, they knew it, like they didn't have any more questions. They understood that what it meant to be saved. They didn't have any objections to the Bible, but for whatever reason, whether it was because they wanted to live in unrighteousness or they didn't want to submit and humble themselves and accept the Lord Jesus Christ, they just said, you know what? No, I don't want it. And now those people, they are so hard to talk to. They don't want to talk about it at all. It's, it's almost like when they made that final rejection, they just went the total opposite way, you know? So that's what this is talking about. This is what I believe this is talking about. That these people are so close. These are not people that were saved. These are people that just tasted of the heavenly gift, 
they were partakers of the Holy Ghost, just like somebody that might sit in church but not be saved. They're partaking of the Holy Ghost. They're hearing the words of the Holy Ghost being spoken to them and possibly even understanding it. It's just whether or not they believe it. If they don't and they fall away from the truth, the Bible says here, there is a point when you, if you get so close and you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, that is your last chance and it's impossible to renew you again to repentance. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Man, I, I hope that, that there is nobody like this here that just understands the word of God. You know it, you're sitting here, you, you have no objection to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but for whatever reason, you're not. How sad is that if you reject it and now it's impossible for you to get saved? Now, I've heard um, interpretations of this passage to just mean, um, you know, that it's just believers and they just fall away and it's just hard to get them back into church again. And, and we see that as well, like where believers are maybe just so burnt or, you know, they just get sick and tired of serving the Lord and it's almost their pride just keeps them away from coming back and, and doing the right thing. The reason why I believe it is referring to unbelievers as opposed to believers just getting right with God, because in verse 7 it says here, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So we see here the fruit bringing forth that is acceptable to God. It's a, it's a, it's a blessing um, from the rain. But, verse 8, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So the reason why I think it is talking about people that didn't get saved, it's impossible now for them to get saved, they're rejected, because in verse 8 it says their end is to be burned. So I don't think Hebrews 6 is referring to believers, because their end is not to be burned. When you, if you get taken away from the earth, you're, you're in heaven with God. Um, so I think verse 7 and verse 8 give a strong case for this uh, scenario in Hebrews 6 to be talking about somebody that did not get saved, almost got saved, like um, um, his name is escaping me in Acts where he says, almost thou persuadest to me, me to be a Christian, but they reject it and now it's impossible for them to get saved and they're bearing, they're going to bear thorns and briars and they're going to be rejected um, and their end is going to be burnt. Let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. And I won't read the whole passage just for sake of time. Okay, let's go from, uh, we'll just read from verse 1. It says here, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So Paul is saying here, don't be deceived by anybody that Jesus Christ can come back in every, at, at any moment. You know, like, like he can come back before this, this meeting is even over and we're all just going to disappear and our clothes are going to be there. He's saying here, there's going to be people out there that teach that, but Jesus is not going to come back at any moment. There are things that need to happen first um, before we are raptured. And he says here in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. See, so if you believe Christ can just come back at any moment, you're deceived. Because in verse 3 he says, don't let anyone deceive you by any means to believe that the day of Christ is at hand. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So I don't want to get too much into the end times side of this, but I just want to show you here that there is going to be a, a falling away. Now, what that falling away is, people, you know, surmise can be different things. You know, is it just people going into ungodliness? Is it just people preaching false doctrine? You know, some people think the whole repent of your sins to be saved is the falling away because, you know, there's so many churches that believed salvation by grace were preaching salvation by faith through grace alone, but are now preaching turn from your sins to be saved, the work salvation. So I believe this passage here could possibly be referring to unbelievers you know this falling away whether it's a falling away from ungodliness you know as in uh, like it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah 
where it's just ungodliness abounds, there's going to be this falling away into ungodliness. That could mean, uh, that could be what it's referring to. But the reason why I think it is referring to, it, it could only refer to unbelievers in this passage, is because of here in verse 10, it says here, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So that passage there in 2 Thessalonians 2, from 10 to 12, makes me believe that the falling away is unbelievers falling away, um, like we see in Hebrews 6, where there's an unbeliever that they knew the truth, but they didn't want to receive it, and now they are damned and they cannot be saved. But let's look at two examples that could possibly be believers falling away as well. One of them I'm really sure of, the other could work both ways. But in 2 Peter 3, let's go to verse 17. So if you remember in 2 Peter 3, this is this passage where Peter is actually um, um, uh, supporting Paul's writings in his epistles in verse 16. And then he finishes here on two verses. He says here, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So you can see here, this is an exhortation from the Apostle Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He's talking to believers. He's saying, other people rest the scriptures, but you know, you know, Paul has written these scriptures for you. Some things hard to be understood. And then he says here, ye therefore beloved, seeing ye know these things. So he's, he's, he's talking to saved people here. He says, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So you can see a believer can fall away from a right position as well. So it's sort of like when you come to church and I'm like, hey, get to know your Bible. You know, don't just believe a man. Don't just believe everything I say. You know, study your Bible. Know what you believe because I don't want you to fall away. You know, I don't want you to fall from your own steadfastness, um, being led away uh, with the error of the wicked. Now the last one, and it's sort of similar to the Thessalonians passage where it's talking about end times. But in 1 Timothy 4, um, this is another one, it says here, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, uh, it doesn't use the word fall away, but it says here, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So like I said, this falling away before the end times, in 1 Timothy it says here, some shall depart from the faith. People have mixed opinions on whether this is uh, unbelievers just you know, going into ungodliness and ungodliness in our society just increasing, or whether it is believers departing from the faith, because they'll say, how could you depart from the faith if you were never there to begin with? You know, how do you depart from you know, you know, 20 Arthur Street when you were never at 20 Arthur Street to begin with? So it doesn't use this falling away, um, it, but it uses depart from the faith. Now, this could be believers or unbelievers. I'm not 100% sure, but I just wanted to show you. Second, Second Peter 3, I am pretty sure that that is talking about believers. And I just wanted to show you that here, because remember in Second Peter 3, he talked about being led away with the error of the wicked. Whereas here, he says, they're giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils, people may be taking heed to that, you know, listening to preachers that aren't saved, listening to preachers that have some questionable doctrines, and being led away, not being grounded on the Word of God, knowing what you believe so that you're not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So kind of a roundabout way to, to, to explain Galatians 5 to you, but just wanted to show there that it's, you know, you can easily um, find explanations using Scripture to not you know, go against clear passages in the Bible that teach salvation by grace, you can't lose your salvation. Um, just requires a bit of study and just comparing scripture with scripture so you can see that 
Every time somebody uses a scripture to support a position, generally there's an underlying assumption. You see there, it's, it's like, what does fruit mean? What does it mean to be taken away? What does it mean to fall away? There's always an underlying assumption. Now, these underlying assumptions cannot clash with clear statements in the Bible. That's what you've got to keep in mind. There are clear passages in the Bible that tell us about salvation. And when somebody has a passage that requires an assumption in order to give you an explanation, you've got to think, hey, could that word mean something else in light of another passage of Scripture? All right, I hope that was helpful. I'll end there. We'll just sing another song. Uh...